I'm going to talk today about e-paper, electronic paper, sometimes called electronic ink. Now, e-paper, e-ink is a display technology, a visual display technology. And I can't really assume that everybody is talking out of the same sheet when I talk about other display technologies. So what I intend to do is breeze briefly through half a dozen different display technologies that we may have encountered so that we all know which is which before I go on to a wee bit of detail about how we can use e-ink, first of all, generally, and then in a model railway context. I'm also going to explain how e-ink works with some fascinating, scintillating animations. You'll be falling out of your chair. Make sure you're strapped in and that the nurse is nearby for when these animations start happening on this display. You're going to, you're going to love this, I promise you. So starting with visual displays, there are half a dozen types, LED, OLED, three different flavours of LCD that we're all aware of, and then e-ink. So we'll start with LEDs. We all know about light emitting diodes. They're cheap, they're bright, they can be multicolour in as much as you can have LEDs of different colours, red and green and yellow and blue and white, or you can get variable colour, you can get a LED that will change colour. So-called neopixels nowadays are actually variable colour light emitting diodes. They tend to be limited to circular dots or rectangular dots, little lines or seven segment displays. You can control them directly by plugging them into the side of a microcontroller. You can control them via I squared C, SPI or Charlie Plexing. There's a excellent, a most excellent presentation on Charlie Plexing in the, the WASAG YouTube channel uh, from an incredibly good looking fella. Another thing to notice about LEDs is they're daylight readable. You can use LEDs outside, but if it's really, really bright, LEDs are not necessarily the best solution. That's what they look like. Over to the left, you see a couple of seven segment displays being driven by an AT Tiny. And over to the right, you see some more seven segment displays and a couple of multicolor LEDs being driven by a, a Spartan PGA. OLEDs, TFTs, you see these things bandied about. OLED is organic light emitting diode. It's a light emitting diode where the actual light emitting material has got carbon in it. And that's why what makes it organic. And TFT stands for thin film transistor. And that's the switch that they put above the display to let you turn the display on or off. So that's all these little colored displays or mono displays that we get from China. They're usually on an I squared C interface or an SPI interface. Those are the numbers of the chips that are usually used for these displays, and they're well supported. That is to say there's library, library, there's bits of software for Arduino, Raspberry Pi, Pix, JAL, all the boys in the band. There's always a piece of software to get these things to work. Lots of multi-model uh, railway applications, typically annunciation boards, destination boards, um, and again, there's a most excellent example that Neil did. Mr. McNulty put up a lovely demonstration of using I squared C annunciator boards maybe more than a year ago now. And that's at that place on the WASAG website. One of the limits of these is that they tend to be small. If you're going to get an OLED or a TFT display, particularly driven by I squared C or SPI, you're looking at four inches or less. There are some examples. Again, on breadboards, mostly driven by AT tinies. I spend a lot of time making ET tinies jump through hoops. And there's an I squared C one and an SPI one with a touch screen and a couple of mono ones. You also get them that are nearly mono, whereby the display is all that sort of blue colour, except for a band of yellow at the top, stuff like that. There's lots of options with these. 
Moving on to LCDs, the LCD that we mostly know is the one that we're currently sitting looking at. That's a display for a laptop, or a display for a computer system, a monitor. They're sumptuous, they're beautiful, they're expensive, although not very expensive, and they're getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. You tend to not get them less than about 10 or 12 inches in diameter. They need a specialist video card, the video card that comes in a laptop or the video card that comes in your PC, and you can't read them in daylight. If you take your laptop out into the sunshine, you can't read it. You're, you're doing that peering thing. And that's why if you look at an LCD display in a car, it's always got a little plastic binnacle round about it to make sure that it's continually shaded so that you can read it. Examples. £23 buys you a 10-inch USB monitor. That plugs into USB-C. Really, really useful. I've got a friend who spends a lot of time sitting in car parks charging his electric vehicle. And when he's doing that, he uses a 12-inch or a 14-inch USB-C monitor to watch movies on his phone. So these monitors, they're not expensive. They're very, very flexible. There's the sort of industry standard, 24-inch Dell make it at £60. Gorgeous thing. Can't use it outside. Still with LCDs, we get LCD character modules. Now, these have been about since the 1970s. They're all based on the same chip, the Hitachi 44780 chip. You can use... Four bits plus three is seven bits of your microcontroller to drive them, or eight bits plus three is 11 wires of the microcontroller to drive them. Or you can get an I2C backpack that plugs onto it and gives you an I2C version of the LCD character module. And again, there's library, library, there's software for all the usual suspects. You get lots of colour schemes. You get green on black, black on green, black on yellow, yellow on black, black, white, blue. But it's always mono. It's always one colour on another colour, and that's all you get. And again, for the most part, they're not daylight readable. There's a, an excellent video on the WASAG website from Davey showing how to make an LCD tester to test these LCDs. There's the, the video. And there's what they look like. We've all seen these guys. That one's on a breadboard with an Atmega Mega 328. The last of the LCDs is the TN or Twisted Pneumatic Display. And that's the one that turned up on your watch in 1976. It's a, a gray display with text on it. They can be pixel based, but not so much. They can be seven segment. They can be starburst. If you're willing to spend a few hundred pounds, you can actually design your own. There's companies now in China that you can send them an LCD design and they will make LCDs for you. Again, there's software available for all the usual suspects. And these are the ones that are daylight readable. In fact, the brighter it is outside, the easier it is to read a TN display. There's a couple of TN displays. The one on the left is a, a pixel-based display, again being driven by an AT Tiny. And the one on the right is just a, a seven-segment display. I also mentioned Starburst displays. There's a Starburst display on a 1979 calculator. If you notice the M has got the lines going into it and the W has got the lines going into it and the little bit of the R, the tail of the R going down, that's the starburst part of that display. So having covered all the other bases, we're now getting on to e-ink or e-paper. This can be very, very cheap or very, very expensive depending on what you want to pay and how you want to source things. Lots of sizes. It 
you can get them from about three quarters of an inch up to 26 inch, up to monitor size. Tends to be either black and white or black and white and red, or maybe three, four color. It's okay for text, it's okay for graphics, it's good for clip art, it's not great for photos. Photos look horrible on it. Nearly always based on this SSD 1606 controller, and that's a, basically an SPI controller. SPI on one side and all the wires to drive the display out the other. So all you need to do is be able to drive it with SPI. It's daylight readable. In fact, the lighter it is, the easier it is to read. The first generation of these things, there's one there. That's the, one of the first ever e-readers from Sony. And that's now 14, 15 years old. Uh, that one there's mine and it still works and it is still excellent. It's a gorgeous thing. Brushed aluminium, calfskin leather cover, beautiful thing, great for taking on holiday or taking to the beach because you can hold a hundred books on it, no bother at all. The second generation ones, a few years later, there's a couple of second generation displays. As you can see, the one over to the right has had a little bit of abuse down through the years. It's got some sticky columns and some sticky rows. The one on the left is a big old Kindle, 10 inch Kindle, so I can use that if I'm working at the computer and I need to have data sheets handy, then I can use the data sheets on the Kindle. I can search through documents. It's big enough to read. It's like having all the data sheets in the world on a piece of, you know, a thing that will stand on. Remember the document stands you used to get when computers came out first for people that were typing things into screens and they had a thing for standing the document on? Well, a document stand with one of these on it is really, really useful for when you're actually doing electronics design work on the main screen. The current generation are called paper whites. Look at the price of that, £150, and that's £150 with adverts. If you want it without adverts, you've got to pay 20 or 30 quid extra so that they don't put adverts on it every second or third page. Right? But if you want to buy it with the adverts, £150. Although you do need to pay that, I'll explain as we go on. The current generation ones are waterproof. They've got backlights on them, they've got front lights on them, so you can light it up wherever you happen to be. One of the things about e-paper is that you need light to see it. It's reflective. So I'm going to talk a wee bit about how it works. And don't worry about that £150 price. We're, we're going to talk about that as we go on. Now, you all remember doing the thing at school whereby you use a shatterproof ruler and rub it on your jumper and use it to pick up little bits of paper or little bits of polystyrene. I've got no idea why it was shatterproof rulers. There's a whole, a whole comedy thing I could do there about shatterproof rulers but I'm not going to bother. But if I get a piece of plastic and rub it to make it electrostatically charged, it will attract little bits of polystyrene. And little bits of polystyrene are very, very light. So if I take a white polystyrene bead and put a little bit of plastic inside it, but before I put the little bit of plastic into it, I charge it electrostatically, then I've got this little electrostatic ball. What I'm now going to do is first of all paint one side of it black and paint the other side of it or leave the rest of it white and I'm then going to mount it between a couple of fine wires, a couple of electrodes if you will. If I then make the ball mounted in such a way that it can rotate if I am to charge those wires, if I put a plus and minus onto those two electrodes, then what happens is that in electrostatics, opposites attract. So a plus will be attracted to a minus, a minus will be attracted to a plus. But it's electrostatics. 
So there's no electric current. So there's no electricity flowing in this situation. But if I put those charges on like that, then what will happen is the bead will rotate to that orientation and the eye will see the white side of the bead. On the other hand, if I make the charges be that way around, then the bead will rotate that way and the eye will see the black side of the bead. And that's all it takes to make a reflective electrostatic display. And that's how e-paper works. Only these beads are, um, you know, a hundredth of a millimetre across, 3,000 of them to the inch. Uh, so you get a fine, fine, fine display. And what you do is you make a transparent containment at one side, a mechanical substrate to stop it all flopping and dropping at the bottom, lots and lots of fine electrodes, and you've got a very basic black and white display. If I make it slightly more complex, I put four wires round about my bead. And my bead has now got four colours on it. Then if I put my charges in that way, negative to the top, positive to the bottom, the positives are attracted to the negatives, the negatives are attracted to the positives, that's fine. It will settle that way with the white side visible. If I now move the charges on the wires via electronic switching, then what happens is the bead will rotate and the green side of the bead will be visible. Another switch of the, uh, the, the wires, more electricity in the opposite directions, and this time when it rotates, the blue side of the bead becomes visible. And lastly, obviously, if I switch it that way, then the red side of the bead becomes visible. And that was how the first generation of these worked. The current generation, I was on Wikipedia looking this one up, looks like that. The bead is replaced by a transparent plastic microcapsule. And inside the transparent plastic microcapsule is a transparent oil. And there's tiny, tiny bits of white pigment that are positively charged and black pigment that's negatively charged. And so by arranging the charges, I can have it all white, all black, or black and white have a grey effect by putting the black to one side and the white to the other. The problem with this is that when you do that, some of the white will get trapped, either because they become attached, electric, electrostatically attracted to a nearby negative part, or simply because they get trapped by the bulk number of negative parts. So you get whites trapped among the blacks, you get blacks trapped among the whites, and so you get this grey muddiness on the modern e-ink e displays. And that shows itself, and if you look closely at that, you'll see shadowing, and you'll see ghosting. You'll see where the the... the the display has turned over, but it's not just clean. You can see a little bit of the previous page on that page because of this effect whereby the changeover hasn't been clean. In order to make the changeover clean, what you do is you flash it three or four times. But if you do that, that slows the whole thing down. This process isn't quick. You're waiting on these things migrating through oil, which doesn't happen quickly. And so you have to migrate them three or four times to get them to all come to the one side, and it's not guaranteed. So for big, normal displays, e-paper isn't currently the weapon of choice. There are companies that will sell you an e-paper monitor. There's 24-inch or 25-and-a-half-inch monitors, black and white or colour. But if you're interested in these, I implore you, go to YouTube, go to the internet, look up reviews. 
I can't say the reviews are mixed. The reviews are all the same. These things just aren't ready for prime time yet. For displays, for laptops, or for computer displays. And also look at the price. $1,700, which is £1,500. Probably more like £1,700 or £2,000 by the time you got to, to the UK. Really, really expensive. Really, really muddy. Not necessarily grand. Now, what I'm going to do next is show you this little bit of video. This is a, a modern, fast updating e-paper display. This updates 11, 12 times per second. So it's sufficiently useful that you could use it. That's a, been a model of a car display. It's made by a company called Soldered. And it's a thing called an ink plate six motion. And it really is the sort of cutting edge of what you can do with e-ink at the minute. And the guy's about to demonstrate that it's an e-paper display by pulling the plug out. And when you pull the plug out, it just keeps the display. Doesn't change. There you are. He's pulled the power out and he's still got the display that he had when it was running. It's a smashing piece of kit. It's where the, the cutting edge of these things are, and basically there's still a lot of work to do with e-ink displays. So, advantages of e-ink, low, low, low power. They don't take any current at all. Your controller takes a little bit of current, but that's all, and the, the controller only uses current when it's updating the display. And when you switch it off, the display says, stays where it was put, which is really, really useful. There was a trick I used to do, debugging programs, whereby you would connect an ordinary old nine pin dot matrix printer and you would send errors to the dot matrix printer. And that way, when the thing crashed, when you come back to it, you could see what the last error was because it was still on the printer. Similarly, with an e-ink display, if you've got a, a micro project and you're working on it, if it puts its errors to the e-ink, then what happens is if it dies, the e-ink will have the last error that it saw because the e-ink will retain that image. It's daylight readable, which is great. The brighter it is, the easier it is to read. It's got a simple SPI interface. Because it's 3,000 dots to the inch, you get many fewer jaggies so that uh, you can get some really nice easy on the eye fonts, and it's nice and easy to read. You can read an e-ink display all day without your eyes getting sore, which is why they use them in these electronic books, that and the low, low power consumption. And passive lighting. They read, they, you need light to see them. Now that's good in a model railway environment because if you have a, a layout, you want, if you've got a, a subtle wee display somewhere, you don't want it shining out light, sort of like a beacon in the corner of your display. You want it to just stay there and, and you know, you, it's not the star of the show. The star of the show is somewhere else. But if you've got subtle displays, then that passive lighting thing is really, really good. Disadvantages, the update rate. Two, three times a second is fast for these things. Once every two or three seconds is more like the rate that you actually get. Cost, they can cost from practically nothing up to serious money. I'm going to talk about that next. That retains image when it's off or failed. I've got one of these here with information about the pond. It's got the flow rate into the pond, it's got the temperature, it's got the turbidity, it's got the colour of the water, it's got all that stuff on a display and a, a, win, a, a picture frame on the wall. The only problem is that if it fails, if the battery goes flat on it, you don't notice till the following day or whatever, because you'll notice and you think, oh, wait a minute, that the time in that hasn't updated. So the information that it's given me is no longer current. It stopped and I didn't notice that it stopped. So retaining the image when it's off can be both a blessing and a curse. Similarly, with passive lighting, I had one of these that I used in the bedroom uh, simply to keep me up to date with weather and traffic and stuff like that. But it needed a light. 
because it's there's no light of its own. Now that's good in the bedroom because you don't need a light on, you know, you want your bedroom to be dark. But when you want to see this thing, you have to put some sort of lead on it to let you see what's going on. And as I've explained, it's quite a, a young technology that's still got a distance to go. And so if you want to use this, you might think, oh, I'm going to leave it for a while. You might wait till there's better controllers. You might wait till there's more library, or li there's more software available for it. There's lots of options. So let's have a wee look at what is available. Our friends in China will sell you this one. This is a wave share, 4.2 inch. Now, 4.2 inch is 400 by 300 pixels, and that's 0.12 megapixels. So it's not even an eighth of a megapixel. So it's quite controllable by a micro a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino or whatever. The panel itself will cost you £13 from China. The panel plus the controller, £22-£23. If you want to buy it locally, Amazon will sell you exactly the same thing, but they'll charge you £40 for it. And as I say, 400 by 300 doesn't seem like an awful lot if you're used to working with the sort of displays that we use on computers and laptops, but you can get a lot of information on that display. There it is being driven by a, an ESP8266. That's a weather station. It's just being driven by SPI. You can see the, the wires going in at the side. 3.3 volts, SPI, and it's got three graphs plus half a dozen directional displays, and you get a lot of information out of your 1200 pixels. Here's a bigger one. That's a, a 10 inch display. And it's actually a, a prototype display for a laptop. The card that you see over to the right isn't a video card. It's a Spartan FPGA, it's a development board. And it's driving that display. And as you can see, it's got Visual Studio in the background and it's got the circuit diagram in KiCad for the display in the foreground, and that actually is workable, but the refresh rate is hellish. Where they are finding a market is in el electronic shelf edge labels. You can buy electronic shelf edge labels, and if you go to Alibaba, as you can see, there's 1,646 products available when I did this through the week. And these are all, as you can see, they're fairly small. They're small in terms, of, they fit a shelf edge, they're maybe two and a half inches by an inch. Absolutely beautiful for hoardings and posters and stuff on a model railway layout. And you can get these for a couple of pounds. The display technology keeps upgrading. The people that are making these are bringing out new generations of them and new generations of them. And as a result, there's hundreds, thousands of these available on eBay. There's some there for £3, and that's three colour. Now, your £3 there buys you the display. It also buys you the Wi-Fi that's connected to it. The reason that you use electronic shelf displays is so you don't have to go round about and change them manually. You use a computer and Wi-Fi to change them all at the same time. So this thing has got the electronic paper display. It's got a Wi-Fi connection to read and write it. It's got the controller to do all the work. It's got the power supply, and it's got a couple of coin cells to keep the whole thing powered. Entirely self-standing, £3.78. Another one that's slightly bigger, that's, a, I think, a four-inch display. And that's £25 for five of them. So a five in each. Again, you could pepper these all over a layout if you wanted. Another application. These are electronic plant tags. The spiky bit of the tag there has got sensors for humidity and liquid content and stuff like that. The little board has got an ESP32 chip on it, plus the driver for a e-paper display, 
And as you can see, there's a USB there that'll let you charge the thing if you want to. But I suspect that that'll run for a year or so at a time. So at the end of the year, when you take your plants in or you, you're reworking them, you simply charge it, charge the, the, the spike, and you put the information on the plant down through the I square, uh, through the USB into the thing as well. As you can see, it'll tell you about how wet the, the pot is, how much light it's got, what the temperature is, and what the other one is, I have no idea. The Probably the plant percentage moisture. It also has a, a pointer to tell you where it currently is and a display to tell you where it should be. So that if you've got completely no green fingers like me, that gives you a wee bit of a chance. And again, these are these are a wee bit more expensive. These are 10 or 12 pounds each. Now, I'm going to talk very briefly about Kindles because remember I said we're on the, there was the first generation and the second generation. I think we're now in the 14th generation or the 11th generation of Kindle. And a lot of people will sell you an old Kindle for practically nothing, which is interesting. Because, well, there you can see there's lots of them there at 99p. And that's because 99p is the minimum price on eBay. And the one of the reasons that's of interest to me is that the Kindle has a thing called an experimental browser as part of it. And there it is there showing the WASAG homepage. Now, it's an experimental browser in as much as it will render HTML. It will render basic HTML4, some HTML5. It will render basic JavaScript. But all the, the plugins and the extensions that you've currently got for your browser, it won't do any of that. It's a fairly basic web browser. But it's good enough to display a web page on. And the reason that could be important to us is this. If you take whatever sensors or actuators or switches or servos, or there's a Sprog, there's one of uh, Neil's displays, anything that you can connect to a Raspberry Pi or an ESP8266, ESP32, an Arduino, anything that supports Wi-Fi. If it supports Wi-Fi, it'll make a web page. And if it makes a web page, then you can make a web page to control those things. The switches and the servos and the, the sprog and whatever it is. And that means that you can make a web page and use your Kindle as a controller. Either to control things on the way in or to watch things on the way out. Right? And all you have to be able to do is write HTML. You don't need any coding for this. You need basic coding for the, the Arduino or whatever, but that and a bit of HTML, and this is doable, and it's doable very, very cheap. Because as I say, you've got to, the sensors and actuators are on your layout anyway. The Pies and ESP32s cost two and three and four pounds, and the, the Kindle you can buy for a couple of quid. Here's one where a guy has got a Raspberry Pi in the pannier of his bike and he's reading, he had a little bike computer but the bike computer didn't suit him because he's far sighted and so he took the, the inputs that go to the bike computer and sent them to a Pi and the Pi now sends a web page and the web page as you can see gives him a great big bike computer, gives him his speed, uh, his average speed cadence, that's how many turns of the, the the, the driven wheel for turn of the, the pedal sort of thing. All that stuff for nothing, just using a Raspberry Pi and a Kindle. So what can we use? What can we do with it? Trackside ads, dead simple. Add trucks. If you want to put a little truck with adverts on the side like they do for general elections and so on, you could make one of those with one of these, no bother at all. Truck sides. If you've got lorries in your layout, you could put these in the truck sides and it would change with the era being modelled. So if you want to make it go back to the 20s and have steam, you could make 20s style adverts 
bring it to the 70s. You could put 70s style adverts. Shop window displays, no bother at all. A dynamic description, sorry, on a demo. If you've got a demo layout at a show, you can have an e-paper display in front of it that gives you descriptions of what's going on and changes and updates and does all that stuff and will run all day on a charge without having to power it and, and worry about running cables to it or any of that stuff. The previous one there, there we go, there's a mimic panel basically made out of a, a Kindle, so it could do that. Pepper's Ghost is a, a theatrical effect whereby you show something but hide it and reflect it in a piece of glass or a piece of plastic and you don't, the, the onlooker doesn't see the original display but sees the reflection and sees something floating. And because these are reflective displays, they're ideal for ghost effects like that or reflective effects like that because they're reflective displays. So hopefully there's something there for everyone to give everybody an idea that maybe I've got a use for this. It's maybe not something you thought about, but it might be something that would apply. And that's all. If you've got any questions or comments, or if you want to just simply fawn over the level of animation in that presentation, then you can do that now. <laughs>